أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الهداة المهديين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين صدق الله العلي العظيم Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته one of the most controversial and delicate topics concerning Imam al-Mahdi Ajallah Ta'ala Farjahu sharif is his birth. Who was the mother of Imam al-Mahdi? How exactly was Imam al-Mahdi born? And how did he spend the initial years of his life under his father, Imam al-Askari? These are very important questions that we must understand in order for us to get closer to our Imam. Because the more we know about him, the closer we are to our Imam. We mentioned yesterday that every Muslim believes in the awaited Savior, in Al-Mahdi. And we said that most Muslims do not believe that he was born. They say he will be born in the end of time before he rises and fills the world with justice. But we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, the Shia, the Ja'fari school of thought, we unanimously believe that Imam Al-Mahdi was born in the year 255 after the Hijrah of Rasulullah. So almost 1200 years ago, and then he went into a state of ghaybah and Allah has prolonged his life until today, until he will reappear one day and fill the world with justice. And today this belief that Imam al-Mahdi was born almost 1200 years ago, it has become an unquestionable and undeniable belief and creed of a Shia. So you won't find any scholar from the Shia or any educated Shia that will doubt the fact that Imam al-Mahdi was born. It's very clear cut. And we all believe in that point. Now, however, if we go back in history, what you'll find is things weren't always like that between the Shia. The Shia weren't always at a state in which all of them knew and agreed that Imam al-Mahdi was born. If you go back, you find times of confusion where the Shia themselves, they had disagreed in this point. Is Imam al-Mahdi born or is he not born? And to better understand this point, we will inshallah go over three main points. Number one, who was the mother of Al-Mahdi and what's her story? And number two, the second important question, how was Imam Al-Mahdi born and in what, under what circumstances was our Imam, the Imam of our time born? And number three, the third important question that we must go over, why was there so much disagreement and confusion about the Imam, about our Imam and how did he live the first years of his life? under his father. So we begin with the first point. Number one, who was the mother of Imam al-Mahdi? As Shaykh al-Saduq rahimahullah in the book of Kamal al-Din, and as Shaykh al-Tusi rahimahullah in the book of al-Ghaybah, two of our great scholars that lived over a thousand years ago. They both narrate the story of the mother of Imam al-Mahdi. The story begins during the time of Imam al-Hadi, our 10th Imam. Imam al-Hadi lived in Samarra. Imam al-Hadi had one a companion by the name of Bishr ibn Sulaiman. Bishr ibn Sulaiman narrates the story. He says, one day Imam al-Hadi summons me. He tells me, I need you to do something for me. What is it? He says, I need you to go to Baghdad. And I want you to go to Baghdad and buy a slave, a female slave for me. He gives me a letter. In that letter, it's not Arabic. It's written in either Greek or Latin in the language of the Roman Empire of that time. He says, go to Baghdad. He gave me 220 dinars and go buy me a certain slave. He told me exactly where to go and who to buy. He said, go stand by a river. You'll see a, car a caravan, it will arrive. You'll see in that caravan, it's filled with female slaves and the owner is selling them. Go and buy a certain slave with certain traits he told me about for this amount of money. He said, I, I said everything, I did everything that Imam al, Imam al Hadi asked me. I went to Baghdad, I took the letter and the money. I went and I stood by that river all of a sudden I saw indeed a caravan came and it was filled with slaves, female slaves. So I went to the owner, I said, can I check your slaves? He said, yes. I saw, I looked, I see subhanAllah, I found the one Imam al-Hadi is speaking about with this traits, with this feature, she looks like this, she's wearing this. So then I tell the owner, I want to buy her. And then before I told him that, I took the letter of Imam Hadi and I gave it to that female slave. 
He said, as soon as the slave opened the letter and she began to read it, she began to cry and weep. He says, I don't know what's going on. So I tell the owner, I want to I wanna buy the slave. He says, I'm not sure. When she hears that, she looks at the owner. She tells him, look, I swear if you do not sell me to this man, I will commit suicide. I'll kill myself and you'll lose the whole money. So sell me and get rid of me. So the owner, when he sees this, he says, fine. He says, I gave him 220 dinars and I took this female slave. I took her to the city of Baghdad in a place to rest and then tomorrow we'll go to Samarra. So when we arrive at the resting area, I asked her, what's your story? And I see her, she takes out the letter, the same letter of Imam Hadi and I didn't tell her who's this who this letter is from, I didn't tell her anything, I just gave her a letter. I saw she took out the letter, she began to rub it on her face and her eyes and she began to kiss it like barakah. So I told her, what's your story, what's going on? She tells him, look, no one knows my story but you. So we have to keep this a secret until we arrive to Samarra. What is it? She tells him that I, my name is Malika and I, on my father's side, I am the granddaughter of the Roman Emperor. The Roman Emperor is my grandfather, he's my father's father. And on my mother's side, I am a descendant of one of the disciples of Isa, Jesus. Jesus, we know he had, he had 12 disciples, the 12 Hawariyin, the close companions. One of them by the name of Simon Peter, he's my grandfather. If you go back in history, he's my grandfather. So you see both on her father's side and her mother's side, it's a very noble lineage. Royalty and what? And, 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 and the disciple of Jesus. So then she tells him, this is my story, that I'm very close to my grandfather, my grandfather who is the emperor, and he loves me a lot, I'm very dear to him. He said, she says, one day my grandfather decided that I must marry my cousin, who's also his grandson. So he said, I must marry him. He held a huge, extravagant, magnificent wedding for, for, for us. He invited thousands of people, all the dignitaries, all the officials, the military officials, everyone in the country, and he, he held a huge wedding. He said, as the wedding, she says, as the wedding was about to start, it was either in a church or in the palace of the emperor, there were crosses that were hung in the place. As soon as the wedding began, the crosses began to shake, they fell, they broke, the pillars of the building, they began to shake and they collapsed, everyone started running, chaos. The wedding was called off. It was ruined. One of the priests, he told my grandfather, look, it appears that there is a curse in this marriage. This wedding, this marriage should not happen. There's a curse. You saw what happened. The crosses fell. So these two shouldn't marry. She says, but my father, my grandfather insisted, no, they must marry. So once again, a few days after, he held a second wedding. And the same thing happened again. This time when the crosses in the, in the, in the building it collapsed, he said the, the pillars began to collapse. My, my grandfather now, he realized that yes, there is a curse. It can't be just out of coincidence twice in a row this happens. But he was very distraught. He was very distressed and upset that this wedding cannot happen. She says, that night I saw a dream. It was a very unbelievable dream, a great dream. What did she see? She said, I saw in my dream that Isa, Prophet Isa, with my grandfather, Simon Peter, the disciple of Isa, they come and they enter the palace of my grandfather, the emperor, from one side. From the other side, I see the prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he enters from the other side, and they come and they greet each other. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They come and they greet each other, they hug each other, and then the Prophet, he tells Isa, our Prophet tells Isa, that I have come to propose from your disciple, uh, one of his granddaughters, for one of my grandsons. I want one of my grandsons, uh, Rasulullah tells Isa, to marry one of the granddaughters of your disciple. Who? Malika, me. I want to propose Malika to my grandson. And she says, I see there was a few people around the Prophet and amongst them was Imam al-Askari. Now she didn't know Imam al-Askari who he was, but the story in the story in the dream was Imam al-Askari. So then Isa, he looked at Simon Peter, Shamoon, and he told him, you should accept this honor. This is Rasulullah proposing your daughter. This is the greatest honor. So accept it. He said, I accept. She said, my grandfather accepted. And then there was a huge member in my dream. Rasulullah, our Prophet, ascended the member and he married us. Now, Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. 
She says, I woke up after this dream, after this unbelievable dream between Rasulullah and Isa and Shab'un and all of this, I woke up and I was so happy. But I had loved Imam al-Askari, that man that I got married to in my dream, I fell in love with him. All I could think about was Imam al-Askari. All I can think about, all that was on my mind was Imam al-Askari. She says, I was in love so much with Imam al-Askari that I would not eat food or drink to an extent that I fell sick, I fell ill. And my grandfather would bring the doctors. I wouldn't say what's wrong with me. I didn't tell the story to anyone because I was afraid if I tell them this, you made this up and so on and so forth. So I just told them I'm sick. They brought all the doctors. They couldn't do anything for me. My grandfather was so upset. What's wrong with you? So he came one day and he told me, my dear granddaughter, is there anything that I can do for you, for you to feel better or no? She tells him, yes, my dear grandfather. If you do one thing, I may feel better. What is it? I want you to free all the Muslim prisoners under the... Roman Empire. Now that time it was the Byzantine Empire. So I want you to free all the Muslim prisoners. She had started to love Muslims because she what? Because in her dream she became the wife of Imam al-Askari, one of the Imams of the Muslims. So I want you to free them and I want you to give charity. Give them charity and if you do that, inshallah, Jesus will cure me. So he says, fine. If that will cure you, if that will help you, I'll do it. She says, my grandfather freed all the Muslims and he gave them charity. She says, I didn't become better because I was still missing Imam Askari. I wanted to see Imam Askari. But she says, I started to pretend that I am better to please my grandfather. So once he saw I am better, I'm starting to eat and drink. He became so happy. He started to become so generous with the Muslims and the Muslim prisoners. And I was also happy because of that. She says, a few days later, I see another dream. She says, I see another dream. In this dream, she's telling the story to Bishr ibn Sulaiman, the companion of Imam al-Hadi. I see Maryam, the mother of Isa, she comes to me, and she's walking with another woman, a noble woman. Her face is all Iman. I ask Maryam, who is this? She says, this is Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. This is the best woman in the universe. And she tells me that remember in your first dream when Rasulullah married you to his grandson? Fatima is the grandmother of Al-Askari, the man that you were married to in the dream. So she says, I went to Fatima and I began to complain to her in my dream. Why hasn't Al-Askari come to me in my dream? Why has he neglected me? Just one dream and that's it. I fell in love with him. Why hasn't he come? Fatima tells her in the dream, the reason why Al-Askari, my grandson, hasn't come to you is because you're not a Muslim. Embrace Islam, only then he'll come to you. You're not a Muslim, he can't come. So she says, if I become Muslim, he'll come to me? Fatima says, yes. And if you become Muslim, if you say the shahadatain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be happy with you. Isa, you're a Christian. She was a Christian. Isa will be happy with you. And Maryam, she's right there. She'll be happy with you. And Maryam says, yes. So she says, I saw no choice but to say, Allah ilaha illallah, say Muhammad Rasulullah, and I became a Muslim. She says, as soon as I became Muslim, Fatima hugged me and said, now, from now on, expect to see my grandson Askari in your dream. She says, I woke up, I was even more eager to see Imam al-Askari. That same night, the following night, finally I see that man that Rasulullah married me to, al-Askari. He comes in my dream. And I tell him, I begin to complain, where were you all these days? Where were you? Why didn't you come in my dream and see me? He tells him, he tells her what Fatima told her. Because you were not Muslim, I couldn't come. Now that you have embraced Islam, I will come every night and see you. And now Malika, she tells Bishr ibn Sulaiman, ever since that story, maybe a few days ago, maybe a few months ago, every night Imam al-Askari comes to me. Alhamdulillah. Now after she tells him the story, he's astonished that this is a princess. This is a royal princess from the Roman Empire. And how, is she, how did she, she turn into a slave? So she asked, he asked her, so how did you turn into a slave? And I bought you. She tells him one night Imam al-Askari, he told me, that in a few days, your grandfather, the emperor, he will send some troops. There will be a fight between you and the Muslims. He will send the troops to some Muslim area. I need you to disguise yourself as a servant, as a female servant. So conceal your identity and go with the troops and enter the Muslim land. You will be what? Held as captive and from there we will take you. So he promised her in the dream. So she says, I went with them. We, we lost the battle. They took me as a prisoner of war and they sold me as a slave and this is where you came and bought me in. And then he asked her, so how do you speak Arabic? 
she, she tells him, my father, the, the, my grandfather, the emperor, he loves knowledge and he loves reading and he, lo he loves the different cultures and languages. So that's why he wanted me to learn Arabic. He brought me a teacher and he taught me Arabic. And then what about the letter? What was in the letter? The letter of Imam Hadi, as soon as I saw it, I knew that this had to do with my dream. And this was from Al-Askari or his father and from Ahlul Bayt salam. And that's why I began to cry and I began to rub it on my eyes and my, my face. So she tells him the story. And then Bishr ibn Sulaiman says, okay, we spend the night. Tomorrow I take you to Samarra. The next day, Bishr ibn Sulaiman takes Malika to Samarra. He goes to the house of Imam al-Hadi. He tells her, he tells him, this is the slave that you want me to buy. She enters the house of Imam al-Hadi. Imam al-Hadi tells her, did you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed you that Islam is the true religion and how we kept our promise? Didn't Askari tell you in the dream that do as I tell you and you will reach to us and we will take you from there and here you are in Samarra and I am Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam I'm the one that wrote the letter and then he tells her I have great news for you O Malika now she told him during the when she was telling the story that my true name is Malika but I didn't want anyone to know that I am a princess so I told them I'm just a slave and I'm just a normal woman and my name is Nargis so she changed her name from Malika to Nargis Imam al-Hadi, he tells her now that I have great news for you, Malika or Nargis. What is it? That you will give birth to one of the greatest men in history, the greatest man of his time, and he will rule the world in the end of time, and he will fill the world with justice. She doesn't know what he's talking about. She tells him who will be the father. He tells her, do you remember the dream my grandfather Rasulullah? Who did he marry you to? Yeah, Al-Askari. That man will be your husband. And this is when Imam al-Hadi sends Malika to Imam al-Askari and she becomes the wife of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. So you see the mother of Imam al-Mahdi is a royal princess. Now, what you find is there are, a few, there are a few historians and few scholars who have objected to the story. They say that we cannot accept the story because there are some historical inconsistencies about the story. And I'll mention three objections that they have mentioned and I'll answer them. Number one, they say, first of all, we can't accept the story that the mother of Imam Mahdi is the granddaughter of the Roman Empire and so on. Why? Because number one, the story says, Malika says that my grandfather, his name is Qaisar. In the, in the hadith, she says my grandfather's name is Qaisar. In English is what? Caesar. They say out of all the Roman emper emperors, there was only one Caesar and that's Julius Caesar. This story happened in the 9th ninth se ninth century AD. Imam al-Askari, Imam Hadi, they were in the 9th century. Julius Caesar lived what? Before AD. He was in BC. So he lived maybe 900 or 1,000 years before this story. So how could he be the grandfather of this woman? So obviously this story is made up. So how do we answer, how do we reply to this objection that some historians have said? Now first of all, when we go to the 9th century, we find that when we go to the Roman Empire that was known as the Byzantine Empire at that time, the ruler of the Byzantine Empire, the emperor, in the mid 9th century during the life of Imam Askari, Imam Hadi, Imam Jawad, was a man by the name of Michael III. You'll find it in any history book or encyclopedia. Now, Michael III, they say that he, history says that he was incompetent to rule. He was young, he had no expertise, he was far from the politics, he was always getting drunk, and so on and so forth. So, who was the real ruler during his time? It was his uncle. He had an uncle by the name of Bardas. You could Google him, you'll find him. His uncle Bardas, he was the de facto effective ruler of the Byzantine Empire for 10 years. Now when he became the effective ruler, people began to call him Caesar. And that's why if you, if you write in, in Google Caesar Bardas or Bardas Caesar, you'll find an entire chapter on him in all the encyclopedias. So he was called Qaisar, Caesar. So he could have possibly been who? the grandfather of Malika, the mother of Imam al-Mahdi So this objection is not correct, we've solved it. And also what you find is amongst the things that Malika tells the Bishr ibn Sulaiman when he asks her how did you learn Arabic, she tells him my grandfather, the emperor, he loves knowledge and he spreads knowledge. He spreads it in, in the empire. What we find is the University of Istanbul in Turkey today, Back then, it was called the University of Constantinople because that was the name of Istanbul before the Muslims opened it. The University of Constantinople, if you find and if you search in encyclopedias, it was established by Caesar Bardas. He was the one that established what? That university because of his love of knowledge. So this also proves that the story is true. So this objection, we solved it. We come to the second objection against the story. 
A second objection against this story, some historians have said that in this story we find that how was she caught in a battle between the Muslims and the Romans, the Byzantines. Now, they say that when we look at the mid 8th, 9th century, the life of Imam Askari Hadi, there were absolutely no wars between the Muslims and the Romans. So how, was, how did she go with those troops and she got caught? So obviously whoever made up the story wasn't able to, what, to put it in a time in which there was a war. This is what they claim. How do we reply to this? Now when we go back to history, we find no, this is not true. We see Sunni historians who do not even accept the story. They admit it's in their books that no, there were a few wars during the life of Imam Jawad, Imam Ahadi, Imam Askari between the Muslim and between the Roman Empire, but they were small battles. For example, go back to the book of Al-Dhahabi. Al-Dhahabi is a big scholar from the Sunnis. He has a book called Tariq al-Islam. And another scholar, Ibn al-Athir, al-Kamil fi tariq ibn al-Athir. They have their book by chapters. Each chapter is the events of the year. So they start with, for example, the death of Rasulullah until, I don't know how many years after that, two, three hundred years after that. Go to the year 248 after Hijrah. How many years before Imam Mahdi is born? Seven, because Imam Mahdi was born 255. So this is during the life of Imam Hadi and Askari. Now, they say, both of them, they say that in the year 248 after Hijrah, the Khalifa of the Muslims by the name of Al-Muntasir. Al-Muntasir, what did he do? He gathered up to 10 or 12,000 troops and he sent them to fight the Romans. And there was a battle between the Muslims and the Romans. This is in the year 248. In the same year, the Khalifa died, Muntasir. The next Khalifa came, Al-Musta'in. Al-Musta'in, he had another battle with the Romans and he conquered some of their lands. This is the year 258. The year 251, four years before, before Imam Mahdi is born, there's also a battle between the Muslims and the Romans. The year 253, there's also a battle, and so on and so forth. So, so there's many battles, and this story of Malika could have happened in any one of these battles. So we can't say that there was no battle. This is number two. And number three, some historians and some scholars have said, we cannot accept this report because there are conflicting reports in our ahadith. Like what? They say al kulaini one of our greatest ulama is Al-Kulayni. He has the book of Al-Kafi. I'm sure you've heard of the book Al-Kafi. It's one of the best books that we have in our hadith. It's a book filled of hadith of Ahlul Bayt. Al-Kulayni, he does not mention this hadith of the mother of Imam Mahdi being the royal princess and so on and so forth. They say Al-Kulayni says that the mother of Al-Mahdi was a slave, a black slave from where? From Sudan. So wait a minute, we have conflicting reports. And Al-Kulayni was before Sheikh Al-Tusi. He lived cup a couple of decades before Sheikh Al-Tusi and his Sheikh Al-Saduq. So that's why this creates what? This creates a question mark on the story of the mother of Imam Mahdi being a royal princess. So how do we reply to this? We reply to this by going to the Book of Kafi. First of all, whoever wrote this objection, which many have mentioned, has not understood the Book of Kafi at all because Al-Kafi, Al-Kulayni in Al-Kafi does not mention any of his views in it. It's just a book of a hadith. He does not talk in it. He does not say, I think this, I think that. It's all books, it's all a hadith of Ahlul Bayt that he mentions without saying any opinions, without putting any footnotes. So why were these scholars misled into thinking that Kulayni believes the mother of Imam Mahdi was a slave from Sudan? Because you, if you go to the Book of Al-Kafi, Al-Kulayni, he narrates a hadith. He narrates a hadith in the chapter of Imam al-Jawad because he has a chapter for each imam. In the chapter of our ninth imam, Imam al-Jawad, he mentions a story that happened between Imam Jawad and his uncles. And Imam al-Rada, in the story, he mentions a hadith. He quotes Rasulullah. Imam al-Rada says, in al-Kafi, in this hadith, you can find it today, he says that Rasulullah said this. What did Rasulullah say? He's speaking about Imam Jawad, Imam Rada, and then he says Rasulullah says, Bi'abi ibn khirat al-imam, ibn al-nawbiyya. Rasulullah didn't say who is he talking about, but he said this. He praised the one who is the son of the greatest slave. His mother is the greatest of the slaves, and his mother is an nawbiyya meaning, meaning from Sudan. Nawbiyya means from Sudan. Now, some historians, they understood that the Rasulullah is speaking about whom? Is speaking about Imam al-Zaman, Imam, Imam al-Mahdi. And that's why Kulayni wrote it in his book. So that means Kulayni believes the mother of Imam al-Mahdi is what is from Sudan. But this is incorrect because when we go back, we see Kulayni wrote this in what chapter? In the chapter of Imam Mahdi? No, in Imam Jawad. And the whole hadith is about Imam Jawad. So what does it have to do with Imam Mahdi? 
And that's why all our ulama and historians, they say, yes, the mother of Imam Jawad, she was a black slave from Sudan. We accept this. She was an obiyah. Imam Rada married that black slave and Imam al-Jawad was born. So this is speaking about Imam al-Jawad, not about Imam al-Mahdi. So there is absolutely no conflict of reports about the mother of Imam Mahdi. So these are three objections that we understand the reply to when it comes to the mother of Imam al-Mahdi, Malika or Nirjus. So now that we understand who the mother of Imam al-Mahdi is, now we go to the second question. How was Imam Mahdi born after she went and lived with Imam Askari? How was Imam al-Mahdi born? Likewise, we go back to our ahadith, books of, for example, Shaykh al-Tusi, al-Ghayba, Kamal al-Din, and other books. They mention that Hakima, the aunt of Imam al-Askari, the sister of Imam al-Hadi, she narrates to us how Imam al-Mahdi was born. She says one day, it was mid-Sha'ban. It was the eve of uh, the night of mid-Sha'ban. So tomorrow is mid-Sha'ban, tonight is the night of mid-Sha'ban. It was before Maghrib, I'm at the house of my nephew al-Askari. He tells me, my dear aunt, tonight have your iftar with us and please spend the night with us. Why? Because tonight Hujjatullah al ard will be born. My successor will be born. Hakima had no clue. She says, Sayyidi Mawlai, Imam Askari, who's the mother? We have no pregnant woman. Your wives, if, if the Imam had more than one wife, none of them are pregnant. So what do you mean? How is she going to be born? Who's the mother? How is he going to be born? Who's the mother? Imam al Askari tells her the mother is Narjis or Malika. She says, I went to Nerjus. I just saw her yesterday that there's absolutely no signs of pregnancy. There's so many signs, the stomach, she's going to have contractions, she's going to have certain moods, and she's going to want certain things. Absolutely no signs of pregnancy. I said, how? There's no signs of pregnancy? He told me, trust me, he will be born tonight. He said, this is, she said, this is an imam, I have to submit. She said, I went and I slept, I was doing my ibadat and everything. And then she says, the night kept on going and going until it was close to Fajr, nothing. I go, I see Narjus, she's sleeping. There's absolutely no sign she's gonna, she should give birth in a few minutes, in a few hours. Until Fajr was very close, maybe half an hour, an hour before Fajr. She said, I began to doubt. Maybe it's the wrong night, maybe not tonight. She said, I just had this idea in my mind. I began to doubt it. Imam Askari from his room, he told me, Amma do not doubt. This is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have patience. She says a few moments after that, I see Nerjis, she goes into labor. Subhanallah, everything happened so fast. She went into labor just like that, out of absolutely no signs of pregnancy. She went into labor, and all of a sudden I helped her, and she delivered Hujjatullah ala arda li Imam al-Mahdi ajallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. She says Imam al-Mahdi, he fell down. He went automatically into the state of sujood. This is an imam. This is not an ordinary man. He went into the state of sujood. He was, held, he was holding his finger towards the sky. And then he said the shahadatain. And then he mentioned the names of all the imams, his grandfathers, from Imam Ali to Imam Askari. I said, subhanallah, this is the next imam. This is a miracle. So she, then she says, I took Imam Askar, Imam al-Mahdi, I put him in a cloth, and I took him to his father to see Imam, al -Imam al Askari alayhi salam. So this is a story of how Imam al Askari, how Imam al-Mahdi was born. Now, an objection here that some may have raised. How was Imam al-Mahdi born with his mother ab having absolutely no signs of pregnancy? They say this is impossible. The mother has to be at least seven, eight, nine months before she delivers not just there was absolutely no signs of pregnancy so how is this possible this is a made-up story so how do we reply to this we tell them first of all this is not impossible yes naturally it won't happen but supernaturally with the powers of Allah miracle of Allah everything is possible correct Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he wants he could what he could have someone he could have someone be born with just one minute or two minutes of labor. Allah, didn't He create Adam without a father, without a mother? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, the father, the story of Jesus, Isa, He had no father. How was He born? And this is impossible. And likewise, you, th you see Maryam, her labor was only a few hours. Before that, there was absolutely no signs of pregnancy. All of a sudden, she sees that she's what, pregnant, and a few hours later, she delivers Isa. Likewise, we have two prophets that Allah hid their pregnancy for the entire nine months. Who are they? Number one, the hadith say Prophet Ibrahim. And number two, which all of us maybe have heard about, is Prophet Musa. Why? Because Namrud, who was the dictator of the time, and Pharaoh, the ruler of that time, 
they had heard from their soothsayers and all in their dreams they saw that your rule will end at the hands of Ibrahim or at the hands of Musa. So they wanted to make sure that if there was any child born, they would be killed. That they would not be they would not what? They would not be given a chance to live. And that's why they would go and they would take the pregnant mothers. If it's a boy, they kill them right away. So Allah hid the signs of pregnancy of Musa and Ibrahim to protect the lives of these two prophets. If Allah can protect the lives of the prophets by hiding the signs of pregnancy of their mothers, why can't he do that to Imam al-Mahdi? What's the difference? He can do it there but not here. So if Allah did it a few times, he can do it again. There's nothing norm, abnormal about that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why there's a hadith by Imam al-Sadiq that says, that Fir'aun killed up to 20,000 children to make sure that Musa what will not be born. But he was not able because Allah is more powerful than Musa. Musa was born and Allah hid his, hid his birth and it was at the hands of Musa that Fir'aun was killed. Now, the same thing applies to Imam al-Mahdi. Why did Allah hide the signs of the pregnancy and the whole birth story? Because Bani al-Abbas, they were searching for al-Mahdi. And there was fear. Al-Askari knew if they know, they'll kill him. Now why was there fear? Why were they searching after Al-Mahdi? Al Imam Askari in one hadith, he mentions two reasons. Number one, he says, Bani al-Abbas, they're always after us. Likewise, Bani al-Umayyah, but more Bani al-Abbas. They're always after the Imams. Why? He says, number one, because they know that they are not entitled to Khilafah. They know this, they're not entitled. And they know we Ahl al-Bayt are more entitled. This is our Khilafah. So because they know they're not entitled, they're not qualified, they always have a sense of what? A sense of, you know, um, um, insecurity. That the imams of that time, they want to what? They want to hold an uprising. That they, the people will go after them, not after us. So they were always seeing the Ahlul Bayt as what? Posing a threat to their rule. That's why all the imams were killed. Can't you, why would you, if you're just a normal historian, the imams had no weapons, the imams had no people, the imams wouldn't mobilize. Why were every one of the imams killed? Imam Zain al-Abidin killed, Imam al-Baqir poisoned, Imam, Imam Sadiq, Ka'adam, all of them. Why are they killed? Because the threat. So Imam al-Askari himself, he was killed. So Imam al-Askari knew if he leaves them, they'll kill him. That's number one. Number two, he says, because Bani al-Abbas, they had heard the ahadith of Rasulullah about al-Mahdi. So many ahadith from Rasulullah speaking about Al-Mahdi. Al-Mahdi will destroy the evil ones. Al-Mahdi is what? Is the one that will remove the oppressors, the evil government. And then the Imam says, and Bani al-Abbas knew they were evil oppressors. They knew themselves. And they knew if Al-Mahdi is born, the first person he will try to remove is us. So let's try to remove him before he removes us. So they wanted to kill Ahlul Bayt to prevent Al-Mahdi. This is the hadith of Imam al-Askari. So that's why Imam al-Mahdi's birth was concealed and it was protected by Allah. So Bani al-Abbas, they what? They do not place a finger on Imam al-Mahdi because they knew that Imam al-Mahdi would be born. They had spies. Go, they would send female spies to the house of Imam al-Askari to see who's pregnant. If a woman is pregnant, they would put more spies. If a child was born, especially a boy, maybe they would kill him. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hid this entire story of how Imam al-Mahdi was born. And that's why you see, not even the aunt of Imam Askari knew that she was pregnant. He didn't tell anyone. He had to keep it a secret until the Imam was born. After the Imam was born, Imam al Askari السلام, had a very difficult job. Why? Because Imam al Askari now he has to he has two tasks. Number one, he has to tell his Shia that the next Imam is born, or else if he keeps it a complete secret, nobody's gonna know who's gonna follow Imam Mahdi. Of course, he has to tell the Shia. So this is on one side. On the other side, he can't make a general public announcement because the authorities have spies and they're searching for al-Mahdi. So he has to what, keep a fine balance between telling his Shia, but not saying it in a public way. So obviously, there's not going to be a baby shower. There's not going to be a walima for a child because the authorities will know. So he had to secretly tell his Shia, and it was a very difficult job, but he managed to do so. How did Imam al-Askari tell his Shia that my next... My son, the next successor, the next imam is born. Three ways. Number one, as soon as the imam was born, Imam al-Askari ordered one of his wukala by the name of Uthman ibn Sa'id, who became the first ambassador of Imam al-Mahdi that we'll speak about inshallah later. He ordered him to what? He ordered him to go and do aqiqa on Imam al-Mahdi. Aqiqa is what? Aqiqa, anytime a child is born, I have Allah, inshallah, may give us children. When my child is born, it is highly recommended that on the seventh day after he's born, he's one week old, 
I buy a sheep. I slaughter it and I give it as what charity on behalf of the child. This is called aqiqa. And our ahadith say if you do that, number one, that will prolong the life of your child. And number two, it will keep harm away from him. Just like sadaqah. So it's like a sadaqah for your child. And even if you did not do it on the seventh day, do it later. Even the ulama, they say that if you, for example, you're old now and you, you hear the hukum of aqiqa, and you remember that your father never did aqiqah for you. Do it now. You're 20 years old. Do it now. You're 50 years old. You're 90 years old. Do it now. It's highly recommended. So the hadith says Imam al-Askari, not one sheep. How many sheep did he do aqiqah for Imam Mahdi? 300 sheep. Subhanallah. Doesn't it prolong our lives? Imam Mahdi is going to live thousands of years. So he needs 300 sheep possibly. So 300 sheep, they were killed and given to Bani Hashim and the Shia. And the Imam said, by, he told his wakil, buy uh, food for them, buy meat, I don't know, buy... Uh, for example, bread and give it to them. All of this what? Showing that this is, there's a newborn, but not declaring anything. It may be just, for example, invitation. That's the first thing he did. The second thing the Imam did, he would send private letters, private letters, secure letters, to some of the big Shia, the close Shia, the close companions of his, telling them that Al-Mahdi is born. For example, Ahmad ibn Ishaq that I mentioned yesterday, he lived in Qom. The Imam sent him a letter. He says, one day I see a letter from Samarra. Imam Askari says, congratulations, today the new Imam is born. Imam al-Mahdi, he's born. But keep this a secret because I have not told anyone but the best of the companions. The close companions only. Only people the Imam can trust, they will not exp uh, exploit this and expose the secret. So this is the second thing. The third thing Imam al-Askari did was what? He would show sometimes his son to some of his companions. And this was very rare. But there are a few instances. Number one, one of the servants of Imam al-Askari by the name of Abu Ghanim in one hadith, he says that on the third day after Imam al-Mahdi was born, Imam al-Askari gathered some of the close Shia companions, the trusty ones. He told them, sir, I need to show you something. He went and he brought Imam al-Mahdi, a small baby. He told them, look, I have a son. I haven't told anyone, and this is the next Imam. This is number one. Number two, some of the very close Shia, like Ahmad ibn Ishaq, another one like Sa'ad ibn Abdullah al qumi These are big ulama, marja's in their time. If they were living today, they'd be higher than maraja. But because they lived during the time of the Imam, the Imam obviously overshadowed them. They came from Qom to see Imam al-Askari. They said, we enter the house, we see there's a child on the lap of the Imam. We ask him, who is this? He tells us, this is my son, al-Mahdi, and he is the next Imam. This is the second... Time. A third time, another one of the companions of Imam Askari, Yaqub ibn Manqush, it's narrated in history. He says, I went and I asked the Imam one day, do you have a son? Is there a successor or no? He says, do you see this veil, this curtain? Remove it and you'll see something. He said, I remove the veil and I see a young, beautiful boy. His face is illuminating with Iman. He has shining eyes. He says, this is my son and this is my Khalifa after me. And number four, the Ahadith, Shaykh Al-Tusi and the Shaykh Al-Saduq, they narrate in their books, 40 days before Imam Askari died, he gathered 40 of his big uh, ashab. 40. He told them, I have something very important to tell you. They came to his house. It was a secret meeting, no spies. The Imam, he said, he, they came, they asked him about the Khalifa. He told them, yes, this is why I have gathered you. He, the Imam went, he brought his young son. He was maybe, what, four years old. But he brought his son, they saw him. And he told them, this is my son, this is my Khalifa after me, the Imam after me, the 12th Imam of Ahlul Bayt, obey him after me. And then he told them, get a good look at him because you will never see him again. He's going into Ghaybah. So you find the Imam made sure that the important personalities in the world of the Shia, they knew. Yes, maybe the ordinary Shia, they did not know because maybe we can't trust them. But the ulama, the trustworthy ones, the important figures in, of his companions, they were all known, they were all informed that Imam Al-Mahdi was born. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> now, where did Imam Al-Mahdi, the last question, where did Imam Al-Mahdi, Abdullah Farajah al-Sharif, spend those five years, those last five years of his father's life? Because we said he was born 255. Imam Al-Askari died 260. So he lived five years with his father and then the Imam died, Imam Askari died. Where was he during those five years? Because you would imagine, if Imam al-Askari is trying to hide that there's a child, and there are so many spies and soldiers outside the house. Now if there's a child, he's, isn't he gonna cry? Isn't he gonna laugh? Isn't he gonna go run out? For, for example, during five years, he's gonna probably go outside one day. 
So how was the Imam able to hide all that? That's very strange. Where was the Imam during these five years? We have two ahadith that tell us the Imam was not in Samarra those five years. What, they're both narrated by Hakima, the aunt of Imam Askari. One hadith says, she says that after Imam al-Mahdi was born, the story I mentioned to you, she said, I took Imam al-Mahdi to Imam Askari, and he was a baby, and then there was an angel in the house. I saw Imam Askari, my nephew, he raised his hand, and he began to speak to an angel. He gave Imam Askari to an angel, and he told that angel, take him to Allah, because it's not safe for him to stay here. Take him to Allah and bring him once every 40 days. So Imam al-Mahdi was taken by the angel to Allah. Now where was he taken? We don't know. The heavens, to the throne of Allah. There is a hadith that says, after Imam Mahdi was born, two angels, they took him by Allah to the throne of Allah. Maybe he's with Prophet, he was with Prophet Isa because we believe Prophet Isa was also taken to the heavens. The point is he was not in Samarai, he was not in this world, he was in the heavens. And he would only come once every 40 days and that's why some Sahaba, they used to see him, like the stories I mentioned, in that 40 days, in that 40 day period. So she says that he took him and they left. This is one hadith. The other hadith says, Hakim, as she says, that after Imam Mahdi was born, I came the next day. Where is Imam Mahdi? I can't find him. Where's the child? He's not there. I asked Imam Askari, where's your son? Mahdi was born yesterday. He told me, my dear aunt, I have entrusted my son Al-Mahdi with the one that the mother of Musa entrusted him with. Musa, we know, what did she do with her child after he was born? She can't keep him in the house. It's dangerous. She took him in a crib and she placed him in the river, correct? She placed him in the river, she placed him in the hands of Allah. So Imam Askari told her, I likewise placed my son in the hands of Allah. He went to the heavens, but this hadith says, Imam Askari told her, if you want to see him, come on the seventh day. The first hadith said the 40th day, the second seventh. So it's either once every seven days or once every 40 days, Imam Mahdi would come once, and then the rest of the five years he would spend where? He would spend with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a place where we don't know. Now, this continued until a few months before Imam Askari died. Imam Askari, two, maybe three months before he died, Imam Mahdi finally came down to settle in this world. He, Al Mas'udi, one of our ulama, he mentions the story. He says in his kitab, Ithbat al Wasiyah, he mentions that a few months before Al Askari died, he called his mother, the mother of Al Askari. What was her name? Hudayth or Hudaytha. So the grandmother of Imam Mahdi. He, call, he told her, look, I'm going to die in a few months. I need you to leave Samarra. It's not safe to stay here. I need you to go to Hajj. It was Hajj season and back then until they go and come back a couple of months. Go and take my son Al-Mahdi with you. Take him with you. And then he farewelled Imam Mahdi and he left. So the last months, this hadith says that this historical analysis says, the report says that he spent it with his mother in Mecca or maybe in Medina. So the point is, finally the day reached in which Imam al-Askari was on his deathbed. What happened? The Imam never showed up. The Imam never showed up until those last moments when Imam al-Askari was on his deathbed. He came to be with his father on those final moments. Now, the Imam, he spent his final moments with his father, Imam al-Askari, and then the Imam passed away. Now, no one saw Imam Mahdi until this occasion. When? Abu al-Adyan, who was also one of the close companions of Imam al-Askari, he narrates the story. He says, I went to Imam Askari one day. He had some business with me. He told me, Ya Abu al-Adyan, I need you to take these letters to the city of Madain. There are Shia in Madain. Madain is where? It's in Iraq. It's close to Baghdad. Go from Samarra to Madain. I need you to go. Give them the letters. Wait for the reply. Bring back the letters to me. You will come back in 15 days. The whole journey will take you 15 days. When you come back, you will hear, when you enter the city of Samarra, you will hear mourning and crying because you will find me on my, you will find me in my kafan, in my tabus. I will have passed away. So then Abu Al-Adyan tells him, so if you have died, then who do I give the letters to? Who will be the Imam after you? The Imam tells Abu Al-Adyan, I can't tell you his name because it's dangerous. Even Abu Al-Adyan, the Imam doesn't want to tell him his name. And we'll speak more about this later. About even the name of Imam Mahdi was banned on the Shia. Do not mention the name of Imam Mahdi because this is how secretive it has to be. So he told him, I'll give you three signs. Whoever you find these three size signs in, he will be my Khalifa. He says, okay, what's the first sign? 
He says, whoever asks you for my letters, no one knows about my letters except my Khalifa. Whoever tells you, Abu Al-Adyan, give me the letters, that's the first sign. The second sign, whoever leads the Salat al-Mayyit on me, Salat al-Janazah, because as we know, we have a hadith from Ahlul Bayt that if when an imam dies, only an imam can pray on him. A non-imam can never lead the salah on the imam. So whoever prays leads the salah on me. And number three, you will see a group of people, they will come with a belt. There's money in the belt. Whoever informs them of the amount of money in the belt, that is, my, that is your imam after. Abu Al-Adyan says, I went to Madain, I came back, subhanAllah, I see crying, I went to the house, I see Imam Askaris died. Who is basically greeting the people? I see the brother of Imam Askari, Ja'far, man by the name of Ja'far, it's an Imam Hadi. People are consoling him, they're consoling him and they're congratulating him. They're telling him, Mabruk, you're the new Imam. So I said, wait a minute, this is the new Imam? This is the man that Imam Askari was speaking about? Abu Al-Adyan says, Ja'far is not a religious man. So if this is the new Imam, ala al-Islam is salam This is the, the Imam has finished because this man can't be the Imam. And there are a hadith that say Ja'far, the brother of Imam Askari, wasn't so religious, and he just, uh, you know, he he wasn't practicing a religious uh, Muslim, and that's and he did he claimed that he was the Imam, and that's why he was called Ja'far al kadhab But there are a hadith that say he did repent after that. There's a hadith from Imam Mahdi that says that he repented just like the brothers of Yusuf repented. And that's why he was called Ja'far al-Tawwab after being called Ja'far al kadhab Ja'far the liar, Ja'far the repenter. So anyway, so I went inside, I said salam to Ja'far. He didn't say anything about the letters, Ja'far. I didn't say anything either. So the first sign didn't happen. He says, then we went inside the house of Imam Askari. We saw the body of Imam Askari is placed on in the kafan and, and everything. And, and then it's time for salah. The servant, he automatically called Ja'far. He told Ja'far, come and pray on your brother. He says, okay, then Ja'far, is the, this, is the first, this is the first sign. Whoever leads the salah and the Imam. He says, Ja'far, he came. And the other, there was lots of people, officials, people, Shia, so many to come that they had come to the funeral. Ja'far, he came, he stood, he wanted to say Allahu Akbar to lead the salah. He says, all of a sudden, Abu Al-Adyan says, we saw a young boy, he came quickly, he cut his weight. He came to the first line, he held the abaya of Ja'far. He told him, Tanahaya am, move away my uncle, because I am more entitled to pray on my father than you. So now all of a sudden a young boy is saying, this is my father, so he's the son. And I have to pray on him, not you. He says, Ja'far was dumbfounded, he didn't say anything. See the Imam, even when he's young, when it's the Imam tells you something, you can't say no. So Ja'far, he moved back. He says, that young boy, he pray, he led the salah. I said, SubhanAllah, this is the first sign, but he's a young boy. And then he says, after the salah, he came to me, that young boy, and he told me, Abu Al-Adyan, give me the letters of my father from Madain. I said, this is the second sign. This is the Khalifa of Al-Askari. He said, I was waiting for the third sign. All of a sudden, he said, a group of Shia came from Qom. Shia was all, uh, Qom was all Shia back then until now. So you see that they entered Samarra. They're asking for Imam Askari. They didn't know he died. News, news had it wished. The Imam, Imam had recently died. So they came, Who's the, where's Imam Askari he died? Who's the Khalifa? The Khalifa, some pointed Ja'far. You see Ja'far, he's the Khalifa. So they went to Ja'far, they told him, we have some hummus, we have some money, and we have a belt. We want to give you this belt, but let us tell you one thing. Every time we would bring money to you, your brother Askari, and before that to Al-Hadi, and before that, they would always tell us how much money was there before. They would know. This is the miracle of the Imam. So tell us how much money is in this and then we'll give it to you. Ja'far doesn't know, he's not the Imam. He tells him, what? You want me to know Ilm Ghayb? This only Allah knows this? He starts to create some chaos. They tell him, thank you, you're not the Imam. So they were about to leave. Abu Al-Adyan says, I'm, I'm waiting. Who's gonna tell them of how much money is in the belt? All of a sudden, a servant comes of that young boy, of Imam Mahdi. He comes, he tells them, my master says that in the belt there is 1,000 dinars and he tells them this 1,000 dinar, who's it from? 50 is from Fulan, 100 from Fulan, 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 and it's 1,000, they saw it's all correct. They gave him the money to that servant. I said, SubhanAllah, this is the third sign. That young boy is the son of Imam al-Askari and he is the Khalifa of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam and this is when I knew that this is the new Imam of my time. And this, brothers and sisters, shows you how much confusion there was after Imam Askari died. The Shia, now we all know Imam Mahdi was born and he was the, right, the rightful 12th Imam. 
But the Shia and all of them knew this during that time. Why? Because remember we said it was a time of fear, taqiyya. The Imam couldn't say this. And that's why the time after Imam Askari was called what? Al-Hira. It was called a time of confusion. The Shia, they did not know where to go to. Who's the next Imam? Because you find many of the Shia, they, did they had never heard the Imam say, I have a son. They had never seen Imam al-Mahdi. Some had heard, but they were skeptical. Why don't we see him? How come he's never there? How can a six, five-year-old boy be the Imam? So you find that the Shia, they began to divide. Al-Mas'udi, he mentions, one of our ulama, that the Shia, they divided into how many sects after Imam Askari? Up to 20. Some of them, they believed Imam Askari wasn't the Imam because he had no son. So he's not even Imam. Some of them believe that there's no Imam after Imam Askari. Some of them believe Ja'far is the Imam, he's the brother. Others, they said, no, Ja'far can't be the Imam, he's not religious. And we have a hadith from the Imams that two brothers can never be Imams. Only Hassan and Hussein. After Hassan and Hussein, no such thing. It's always father, son, father, son. So it's not Ja'far. So some of them said, what? Then if it's not Askari, Askari is uh, obviously he died. So if it's no Imam Mahdi, it's not Ja'far, then maybe Imam Askari will come back. He's the Qa'im. Some believed Imam Askari didn't die. It was all a show. It was chaos. Everyone believed in one thing. But obviously the, the, the knowledgeable Shia, they knew Imam Mahdi was the next Alim. And that's why this time was called a time of what? Confusion. Hira. They did not know who to turn to. And it was not until the Ghaybah started, the Imam, Imam al-Mahdi, he appointed Sufara ambassadors. They began, the Shia began to see miracles. Only then they began to believe in Imam Mahdi, all of them. Before that, it was not clear. Because the Imam hasn't shown himself. He's a young boy. Imam al-Askari kept it a secret. And it was a very difficult time to live in. And by the way, this didn't just happen during after Imam Askari. Go read history. Even after Imam Sadiq, there was a time of him. Hira, the Shia, even the close Shia, at least after Imam Askari, the close Shia, they knew that Imam Mahdi was the next Imam. The far Shia didn't know. After Imam al Sadiq, even the close Shia. There's a hadith that says Hisham ibn Salim, one of the big Shia scholars. Mu'min al Taq, one of the big Shia. Another one, Abu Basir. They had no clue who's the next Imam because there was a time of taqiyya. Imam Sadiq couldn't say who's the next Imam. That we thought it was Abdullah, the oldest son of Imam Sadiq. We, went, we asked him questions, he doesn't answer right. We said, there's no Imam after Imam Sadiq. Let's go become Mu'tazila. Let's go become Sufis. Let's become Murja'a. Let's become Khawarij. It wasn't until Imam al kazim sent them a sign. They went to the house of Imam al kazim and he showed them that he's the Imam. So this was the, the, this was the, the circumstances of most of the Imams. That it wasn't easy just to say, I'm the next Imam. Or the, my son is the next Imam. Because the authorities, just like they killed Imam Sadiq, just like they killed Imam Askari, they'll kill the next Imam to get rid of this entire family. So if the Imams did not do taqiyya and hide who the next Khalifa is, obviously that Khalifa would be killed. And that's why, interestingly, Imam Sadiq, when he died, Al-Mansur, he sent a letter to the governor of Al-Madinah. What did he tell him? He told him, go and look for the will of Sadiq, Ja'far al-Sadiq. Who is his successor? Kill him. Whoever he, he mentions as well, Fulan is my successor, kill him. They went to the will of Imam Sadiq. He had right, I have five successors. One of them is the governor of Al Medina. So he has to kill himself. Why does Imam do that? Of course, he put Imam Al Kazim and his other son, Abdullah. He tr he's trying to hide that fact that this is my Khalifa, so they wouldn't kill him. It was a time of fear and taqiyya, just like Saddam time. Just like right now, if you go, for example, under in Syria and Iraq, where Daesh, where ISIS, they control. You could say, I'm Shia. You can't say, I'm Shia. This is the leader. This is the Imam of the Shia. So what are they going to do to him? So this was a time of confusion after Imam Sadiq and after Imam Askari. But like I said, it wasn't after years after that, during the Ghayb al-Sughra, that the Shia, no, they began to realize, no, Imam al-Mahdi is our Imam, because he started to show the miracles. And inshallah, we will speak more about the Ghayb al-Sughra tomorrow. By now, we understand how the Imam was born and all the controversies and all the objections that surround this topic, and we have answered them. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us, to accept our a'mal, to give us the power to follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt and Imam Sahib al-Asri wa-Zaman. I ask him to accept our a'mal and our deeds. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Thank you.